about 350 BCE, uh, there was a council that was held uh, among Buddhist leaders, and uh, it was as a result of this council, they, they tried to come together to agree upon doctrines and beliefs and practices, but it turned out that they really couldn't, and so there was a split that occurred uh, after the council was over. This is called the Great Schism within uh, Buddhism, <clears throat> and the Great Schism uh, involved two different groups. The first group was called the Elders, And the second group was called the Great Assembly. And these two groups gave rise to all the different forms of Buddhism that exist uh, today. Eventually, this group called the Elders, or actually fairly quickly, um, developed into a school, uh, actually several different schools of thought they're called Theravada. Well, today it's called Theravada Buddhism. And there were other schools of thought as well, but they've all died out. And the Great Assembly uh, gave rise to a school of thought called Mahayana Buddhism. And uh, Theravada is sometimes called Hinayana although they don't like the word. This is a word that means it means the lesser tradition, whereas Mahayana means the greater tradition, and the Theravada Buddhist, uh, for the most part, reject the word Hinayana, so I just mentioned it in case you happen to hear it. Theravada Buddhism, we'll talk about first, <coughs> it arose from the elder faction of the Great Schism, as I said, and it is the only uh, form of Buddhism to descend from the elder tradition that still exist today. There were others in the past, but they've all uh, basically died out. These uh, Buddhists in the Theravada tradition are concentrated in Sri Lanka. That was where they originated, actually, in Sri Lanka. And they spread to Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, so much of Southeast Asia. If you look on the class website um, under Buddhism, the uh, I have a link to what it says, something like uh, the, the, a map of Buddhist groups or something like that, Buddhist schools. And uh, you can see on the map where the Theravada Buddhists are and Mahayana and then a, a third group, the Vajrayana, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the Theravada Buddhists, uh, they are committed to the Pali Canon. So in that sense, they're the more traditional group. The Pali Canon is the ancient Buddhist uh, collection of texts and they study the Pali Canon. And they also believe in the perfection of a group of people who are called Arhats. Arhats are people who, according to the Theravada Buddhists, have been uh, perfected. They have achieved enlightenment, and uh, Theravada Buddhists believe that all people should aspire to be Arhats, uh, these are the perfect. Those are, they've already achieved nirvana in this life. Um, and so we'll talk uh, more about the arhats and how they are viewed in Mahayana Buddhism in a minute. Theravada Buddhists consists of uh, about 38% 30, of Buddhists today. So, not a majority, but you know, a pretty sizable number of, of people. Okay. The next group is the Mahayana Buddhists. They emerged from what was called the Great Assembly, and you can tell from the name Great Assembly and from the fact that Mahayana means uh, the, the greater vehicle, vehicle be, just being a, a word that means the vehicle of transmission of knowledge. Uh, it was the larger, larger number of people, a larger number of Buddhists followed, uh, followed the Mahayana way. It developed in India, <coughs> um, out of the, the, uh, this great schism, and it was the majority tradition, although not by a huge amount, but it was definitely the majority tradition, and it saw itself as a liberating vehicle for the masses of people, um, whereas the Theravada Buddhists mostly concentrate on the Pali Canon. Mahayana Buddhists certainly accept the Pali Canon, but they have a number of other writings as well. They have a, uh, they 
created over the years, over the centuries, new scriptures called Perfection of Wisdom Literature. Uh, there's an emphasis among Mahayana Buddhists on compassion for all sentient beings, for the emptiness of all phenomena, that there's no meaning in anything, in other words, uh, the transcendent nature of the Buddhist, of the Buddha. And um, they emphasize the fact that the Buddha himself, remember I said that even though he's known as the Buddha, there are actually many different Buddhas in Buddhist tradition. This is just the main one that people talk about. And so Mahayana Buddhists believe that the Buddha attained enlightenment by following the uh, path of the uh, Bodhisattva, and I've used this word before, but let me write it up here again. The Bodhisattva. Now, this is in contrast to the Arhats. For Mahayana Buddhists, the Arhats have attained enlightenment, but they actually occupy a lesser uh, role, a lesser status than Bodhisattvas, because whereas Arhats attain enlightenment and uh, attain nirvana and basically, at least from Mahayana perspective, basically just cease to do anything. They just meditate and while away their time until they eventually enter nirvana at their death. Whereas the bodhisattvas are engaged in, um, you might call it evangelism, It's they're engaged in taking the message of the Buddha to uh, other people and setting them on the path of enlightenment. And so for this reason, uh, Mahayana Buddhists believe that bodhisattvas are of a higher, uh, have a higher status in Buddhism than arhats do because of the altruism of the bodhisattva. In fact, some bodhisattvas, uh, according to Mahayana Buddhists, um, put off attaining, attaining nirvana for themselves um, so that they can, uh, so they can lead other people to nirvana. So the Mahayana groups spread from India to Nepal, Tibet, China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, and Mongolia. And you can see on the map there uh, on the class website where the Mahayana Buddhists are, the, the, the yellow color on the map. And today, modern Buddhists, uh, Mahayana Buddhists make up 56% of Buddhists worldwide. Well, if you add those two together, you see you get 94%, so we're missing a 6%. And this is where this third group, the Vajrayana Buddhists, come in. And some see it as an offshoot of Mahayana Buddhists, and others say it's just another branch from the Great Assembly. So I'm going to put it down here. Vajrayana is the remaining 6% of Buddhists. What do Vajrayana, Vajrayana Buddhists uh, focus on? Well, they focus uh, particularly on the tantric writings. These are writings that talk about how to discipline your mind and your body through, uh, through mental exercises, through physical exercises. Yoga, yoga comes out of this tradition. Uh, at least some yoga comes out of traditions like this. Um, and also, Vajrayana Buddhists talk about the passing on sacred traditions from teacher to student. And many of these traditions are secret. I don't know if secret is exactly the right word. They, they don't publicize the teachings. If you want to learn them, you are welcome to become a Vajrayana uh, pupil, student, and learn them from a teacher. But they're not typically um, publicized the way that uh, the other Buddhist uh, scriptures or sacred texts are. So Vajrayana Buddhists believe that by following certain tantric techniques, yoga, mind control, uh, you know, meditation, uh, this is how you achieve Buddhahood. So uh, they, they practice the recitation of mantras just over and over again, various yoga techniques, breath, breath control, body positions, things like this. They also use visual aids such as mandalas, and there's a picture of a mandala on the class website uh, under the Buddhist section. They use mandalas as visual aids to enhance or focus meditation. This is similar to the way that uh, some Christians will focus on icons, for example, to uh, focus their meditation 
on uh, Christ or the Virgin Mary or God. Um, so the Vajrayana Buddhists do this with these uh, these artistic uh, works called mandalas. All right. Um, and if you look at the map, you see that the Vajrayana Buddhists are in orange on that map uh, that's linked to from the class website. Now, you may look at that map and you say, well, the orange is as big as the the yellow or the red, why is uh, it so much smaller? Well, because they're, it's focused around uh, Tibet and Mongolia, and uh, Tibet is in the Himalayan mountains, and there's not a whole lot of people there, and Mongolia is the Gobi Desert. There's not a whole lot of people there. So even though it covers a vast uh, expanse of territory, there aren't uh, nearly as many people as are concentrated in the Mahayana and Theravada uh, regions. Okay. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about some of these traditions, and we'll talk about some offshoots from these traditions as well. Uh, in Mahayana, one of the things that Mahayana Buddhists emphasize uh, is emptiness, which is the absence of inherent essence in all phenomena. In other words, there isn't any inherent meaning in anything. So for a Mahayana Buddhist, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of the universe? The answer is nothing. There is no inherent meaning in life, there is no inherent meaning in the universe, and once you realize that, you're on the path to Buddhahood. Um, Mahayana uh, Buddhists also emphasize the idea of perfection. These are six religious practices that are observed by all bodhisattvas, uh, or, or by all on the path to being a bodhisattva. Uh, the perfection of giving, of behavior, of forbearance, that is putting up with people or things, <laughs> hard times, uh, perfection of diligence, of meditation, and of wisdom. These are the six perfections. Mahayana Buddhists also talk a lot about compassion. Now, this is not to say that other Buddhists don't talk about these things as well, but this is these are particular emphases of Mahayana Buddhists. And Mahayana Buddhists also talk about the three bodies of the Buddha, that is, the physical or apparitional body, what it looks like, the enjoyment body, and then the Dharma body. And these, they say, are encountered by Buddhists as they ascend towards enlightenment. Now, as I said in the last video, Buddhists uh, generally reject the notion of the Atman, or the soul, as illusory. This is in contrast to Jains and Hindus, for example, who do believe that the Atman exists. So for Buddhists, the Atman is just an illusion, just like almost everything else is. And so in reincarnation, the Atman, there is, since there is really no soul, it doesn't pass from body to body. So what passes from body to body? Your consciousness doesn't. Your soul doesn't because it doesn't exist. <clears throat> so what passes from body to body for most Buddhists is uh, karma. Karma itself, uh, both good and bad karma, uh, transfer from one life to the next, and only when that karma is completely eliminated can one achieve enlightenment or uh, nirvana. There are some forms of Mahayana Buddhism, as with other religious traditions, there are a lot of different beliefs. Uh, there are some forms of Mahayana Buddhism that thinks that an eternal true self does exist within each individual, and this is sometimes called the Buddha nature that is inside every individual. It's not a substantial Atman or soul which leads to attachment, so you couldn't like be you know, focused, fixated on your Atman, but rather it's an expression of emptiness uh, that is inside everyone that gives everyone the possibility of non-attachment. Okay. Um, there's a, another form of Buddhism uh, that comes out of the Mahayana tradition that's called Pure Land Buddhism. Pure Land Buddhism. Pure Land B Buddhism focuses on the teachings of the Amitabha Buddha. The Amit uh, Amitabha Buddha is different from Siddhartha Gautama. Remember, I said there are lots of different Buddhas. Um, the uh, Amitabha Buddha was a king in a former life. And he renounced his kingdom to become a bodhisattva, to become an enlightened one. And through his great goodness, 
he remained a bodhisattva for five eons. He didn't pass on into nirvana himself, but he remained alive and led many other people into the true teachings of Buddha, uh, of the Buddha and enlightenment. And he eventually created a realm of ultimate bliss, also known as the Pure Land, hence the name of the movement, Pure Land Buddhism. And uh, the Pure Land was uh, a place where the Amitabha Buddha reigns as a celestial Buddha. He is, uh, he encourages people to uh, strive to enter the pure, pure land as a place of gods, of people, of flowers, of fruit, of wish-granting trees. That's kind of cool. Uh, where people are instructed by the Amitabha until they attain enlightenment. So he's there <coughs> teaching people how to become uh, enlightened themselves. And uh, after people become enlightened, and they become bodhisattvas, they may, or well, they, be, they become enlightened, they may choose to remain a bodhisattva uh, and return to any of the six realms of Buddhism to lead sentient beings out of samsara, so they're kind of like missionaries sent to the six realms of existence, or they can stay in the pure land and attain Buddhahood there, uh, just passing on directly from the pure land into uh, to nirvana, thus escaping samsara. So uh, one way to enter the pure land is by reciting the name Amitabha repeatedly. And people then, thus enter the pure land on the basis of their faith in the Amitabha. So this is kind of interesting. This is a tradition that puts a lot of focus on, on faith. And so in this sense, it has certain tie-ins, uh, similarities, I should say, with Christianity. And the grace that is granted to them by the Buddha on the basis of his own accumulated merit. Again, this uh, ties in with some Christian doctrines where uh, the idea that uh, human beings are fallen and sinful and they can only enter into a relationship with God through the grace of Jesus Christ. So similarly, uh, in Pure Land Buddhism, the Amitabha Buddhism extends his grace, his great goodness. I mean, we talked about merit, I think, the last time uh, that is passed on to people. Well, the Amitabha Buddha has a great amount of merit that he is able to pass on to people in the form of grace, and if they have faith in him, they can enter the Pure Land. So this is an interesting uh, variant of Buddhism. Another form of Buddhism that uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of is Zen Buddhism. Uh, Zen Buddhism... Uh, it became, well, it's uh, one of the most uh, popular, probably the most popular form of Buddhism in the United States alongside uh, Tibetan Buddhism. It was popularized in the 70s, I think it was, by a book that was called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which I've read, and it's a great book, but it has nothing to do with Zen Buddhism, or almost nothing to do with Zen Buddhism. But it, it gave rise to a whole cottage industry of books called Zen and something, um, which... I'll let you look up. Zen Buddhism is a form of Mahayana Buddhism that, uh, remember I said, uh, Buddhism spread from India into China. And in China, this form of Buddhism was called Chan, C-H-A-N, Chan Buddhism. When it migrated over to Japan, it became Zen Buddhism. All right. And this is a form of Buddhism that focuses on meditation rather than on sacred texts. And uh, Zen, teaching, Zen teachings offer the potential for the direct realization of the Buddha nature possessed by each sentient being. Remember this whole Buddha nature or that's inside everybody? Zen Buddhism is all about awakening that Buddha nature and letting people be aware of the Buddha nature uh, and having contact with that Buddha nature within themselves. Some schools of Zen, not all of them, but some of them, in addition to meditation, also focus on uh, studying and learning the lessons from a group of stories that are called koans, K-O-A-N-S, koans. And on the class website, I have a link to, uh, I think it's 99 different traditional koans um, that are associated with Zen Buddhism. These are traditional questions and answers that uh, require a great deal of thought and meditation to understand, assuming you can completely understand them at all. 
<coughs> so I'm going to read you uh, one of these, um, but you can look at some of the others. The first one I'm going to read is Cohen number 82, uh, in that list anyways, it's number 82, and it's called Nothing Exists. So Yamaoka Teshu was a young student of Zen, and he visited one master after another. He called upon uh, Dokuan of Shokoku, desiring, he was another master, desiring to show his attainment, he, that is Yamaoka, said, the mind, Buddha, and sentient beings, after all, do not exist. The true nature of phenomena is emptiness. There is no realization, no delusion, no sage, no mediocrity. There is no giving and nothing to be received. Dokuwan, the master, who was smoking quietly, said nothing. Suddenly he whacked Yamaoka with his bamboo pipe. This made the youth quite angry. If nothing exists, inquired Dokuan, where did this anger come from? All right, so you got to ponder that one to see what the meaning, the meaning is. Uh, there's another very famous koan. I'm not going to take the time to read it now, but it uh, has to do with the sound of one hand clapping. So if you want to uh, read that and find out about that, these koans are all very short. So I'll read that, and I encourage you to read some of the others as well. Um, Another form of Buddhism is called Nichiren Buddhism. Let me see, where can I write this? Right here. Nichiren Buddhism. This is uh, another form of Buddhism that arose in Japan. Uh, it was founded by Nichiren, a Japanese Buddhist monk who lived during the 13th century. And Nichiren Bo Buddhism focuses on the Lotus Sutra. Is a book, one of the sacred texts of Buddhists. Uh, rather than focusing on a wide swath of Buddhist texts, Nichiren Buddhism focuses exclusively, or almost exclusively, on the Lotus Sutra. This is a book that is, is, uh, tells the story of the last years of the Buddha's life, and uh, students of Nichiren Buddhism meditate uh, on the Lotus Sutra as a key to enlightenment. And uh, they repeat the name of the Lotus Sutra in, uh, in Japanese over and over as sort of a mantra as well. Okay, Tibetan Buddhism, along with Zen Buddhism, Tibetan and Zen are the two largest forms of Buddhism in the United States. Uh, not in the entire world. Uh, Tibetan is a form of Vajrayana Buddhism. So it's one of the smaller ones worldwide, but in the United States, it is uh, pretty popular. Uh, something like 1.2 million people practice either Zen or uh, Tibetan Buddhism in the United States. So Tibetan Buddhism em emphasizes the study of Buddhist texts. Most Tibetan Buddhists recognize the 14th Dalai Lama, whose given name was Tenzin Gyatso, as their spiritual leader. He's still alive. Uh, there are other lamas as well, other leaders, uh, Tibetan Buddhist leaders. Uh, there's a work called the Tibetan Book of the Dead that describes a 49-day journey of the self from death uh, to entry into an unborn baby. So after somebody dies, the self takes this journey and uh, eventually enters a, a newborn baby. And the uh, Book of the Dead, Tibetan Book of the Dead, as opposed to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, an entirely different thing. The Tibetan Book of the Dead gives instructions on choosing a proper womb among uh, many of the to uh, topics. Um, let's see. Two, two, two. A couple other things I want to talk about. First, I want to mention uh, a series of stories that are called Jatakas. Jatakas... Uh, where is it? Right here. Jatakas are traditional stories about the Buddha, and here we're talking about the uh, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, that Buddha, the, the Buddha that Buddhism is named after. Uh, Jatakas are traditional stories about his former lives in human and animal form, and they're, they kind of sound like, uh, in a way, they remind me of Aesop's fables. They're stories about uh, the Buddha as a you know, as a human, as an animal, maybe he's a monkey or a, or, or a goat or something like that, or a human in various forms. And these are his former lives, uh, an 
elephant, a beggar, a deva, a god, right? And uh, they tell stories and they teach a moral, a moral tale. So in that way, they're kind of like uh, Aesop's fables. And there are various collections of these Jatakas, but the largest collection is in the Pali Canon itself. And there are 547 different poems that tell the stories of the Buddha's former life. And I believe I have a link somewhere on the class website to the Jatakas. Um, and so in these stories, the, the point of these stories is to uh, teach some virtue uh, that's the moral of the story that the Buddha in whatever form he happened to take in the story, is able to convey to modern readers. Uh, another term that you run across in Buddhism is the Maitreya. The Maitreya, where can I put this? Let's put it here. The Maitreya is a future, let's see, where did I put it? Right here. The Maitreya is a future Buddha who will come to teach the pure Dharma in a world that has almost completely forgotten it. So Maitreya, in a sense, is a, a messianic savior figure for Buddhists, for some Buddhists anyways. Uh, according to Buddhist tradition, the uh, Maitreya will come into a world in which it's greatly different from our modern world. The, the oceans are smaller. Uh, humans live tens of thousands of years. And so this Buddhist messiah figure is seen as a metaphor of compassion by Nichiren Buddhism. In other words, they don't take it as a literal story. Some Muslim scholars see, the, uh, see Muhammad as a fulfillment of the Maitreya prophecy, and Baha'is see Baha'u'llah, Baha the founder of Baha'i, as a fulfillment of this Maitreya prophecy. So this is uh, different groups, even within and without Buddhism. Uh, have different interpretations of this uh, prophecy. <clears throat> One thing that ties all forms of Buddhism together is meditation because the Buddha achieved enlightenment through meditation. So that's one thing that all these different forms of Buddhism, the large ones and the smaller ones, have in common. Uh, I mentioned that there are many different Buddhas according to Buddhist tradition. Siddhartha Gautama is considered to be the 28th named Buddha in the Pali Canon, and there's at least one more to come. That's the Maitreya. Uh, so this is Theravada Buddhism. Uh, one of the more important Buddhas in Theravada, Theravada Buddhism was named uh, Deepankara, the Deepankara Buddha. I have a picture of him uh, on the website. It's a traditional picture, a painting. Uh, the, the reason that he's um, significant is he predicted to a young ascetic named Sumedha, that he would eventually become a Buddha in a future life. And Sumedha is the one who, in a later incarnation, became Siddhartha Gautama. Um, Mahayana Buddhists recognize not only these 28 or 29 Buddhists, uh, Buddhas of the Theravada tradition, but they also recognize that there are many other Buddhas, um, some of whom are celestial, that is, living in heaven, rather than terrestrial, such as the Amitabha Buddha, for example, who is significant in Pure Land Buddhism. So I think with this, I will wrap up Buddhism, and um, we'll, let's have some good discussion about Buddhism this week.